What's up, tribe? Uh, Yanni here. We're filming for Unit TV and the Sound of Movement podcast. Hello to all the people listening on the podcast that will be up later on next week. Uh, we are super excited today. We have quite literally, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, the strongest guy in the country under 110 kilos. You are now. I am. It's mm-hmm. official. It's official. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is awesome. This is going to be unreal. We're going to talk strength and uh, powerlifting and quite frankly, a, a lot of things that Rad and I don't know a lot about. Uh, so we're super excited. Let's get this intro real pumping so we can get started. See you soon. So today we have a special guest, Australian strength coach. We're looking at this one up there. Uh, Here he is. And um, we're going to be talking, I don't know, a lot of stuff really. I'm quite excited about this. So, Well, I'll give, um, do you want me to give him a little intro? Yep, yep. Yep. We've also got, um, obviously, my brother Rad on the show. Um, He's just really filling in space because we had an extra chair. (laughs) (laughs) I actually am for this interview. Yanni, uh, Yanni is, I think he's going to be driving this one because he's got... Uh, he's got a stronger history with you. He's known you for longer, and he, um, Yanni's, uh, Yanni's got some really cool questions for you. But for those of you that don't know, this is a good friend of ours, Sebastian Orb, uh, also known as AKA Australian Strength Coach, and now officially the strongest man in Australia under 110 kilos. Uh, so you just won which competition on the weekend was it, Bass? So the federation is WRPF, uh, but it's my friends uh, that own the federation, and I've been competing uh, two times per year. There's one massive one, which is the Arnold's, it's called Pro Raw. And then my second competition that I always do is this, um, it's, it's definitely smaller than Pro Raw, but it doesn't mean I take it less seriously. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was the Nationals. And finally, you know, something I've been working towards for many, many years, I now own the 110 kilogram um, all time total record. I'm allowed to say that, you guys are allowed to yeah, say yeah, that. Yeah. And the reason I'm saying it like this is because it's probably gonna go real quick. It's yeah. just so competitive at the yeah, moment yeah. and I'm gonna milk it while I can. Yeah. <laughs> so so not, what was your total weight? So it's 940 kilogram total. Yeah. So for those people that don't know powerlifting, can you explain what that means? So powerlifting is made up of three lifts, squat, bench press, deadlift. You get three attempts at each lift. So my the heaviest of the three attempts is what goes down towards your total. Yeah. So my heaviest squat was 372 and a half kilograms. Sorry, can we just pause on that for a minute? That was 372 kilograms. Just and wrap half. and a and half. half and a half. Yeah. Just wrap your head around that, folks, for a minute. Can I, uh, <laughs> I've got to wrap my head around it as well. It's, that it's is, completely unrealistic. Dude, to I can me remember. As well. I'm just going to jump in here. Bass used to um, Bass used to uh, be a personal trainer at Unity Gym when we first started five years ago. And uh, I remember at the back of the gym when Bass did his first rep at 300 kilos and how fucking stoked he not was. Not squatting, and... not squatting. That no, that was deadlifting. Dead yeah. That's right. I remember the heaviest yeah, you did that's right. was 250. Yeah, squat. Yeah, uh, two, I, I squatted 260 actually. 260. Yeah. Yeah, six in blues, gym. Six there blues on one of these close okay. racks. Yeah, we could, yeah. all, we could almost hardly fit it on the, on the barbell. But yeah. So that's 110 then, kilos more. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Back then you were squatting deeper than you are nowadays. Yeah, we'll very talk, different technique. We'll yeah. talk about that in yeah. a sec. Yeah. So anyway, keep going with the power lift. So that was your squat, you got three. Yep. 372 and a half, which is an all-time Australian record. That's why I went for, otherwise if the record didn't exist, I'd have just gone for 370. So yeah. uh, it pushed yeah, me to a little to, bit yeah, more, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so then bench press was 240 kilograms, yeah. um, which is another all-time Australian bench press record. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's um, the funny thing is that's probably my strongest lift of all of them. Yeah, really. You know, my squat's very strong, but um, two forty. Two forty. You yeah. know, comparative to the what rest of the country. What were you doing when you were back here? I think you were doing like one eighty or something. No, I was, 200, 200, I was doing I was doing two hundred for reps. Yeah. 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 The, the best I did was I believe two hundred for three, for three, three reps three back reps here. here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, and um, and then deadlift. It's it's a it's funny to say it and it's stupid to say it, but that's my weak lift. That's yeah. three hundred and twenty-seven and a half kilograms. Yeah. Um, so 
that lets me down usually when I'm up against the best guys in the world. So yeah, when I compare myself to the best guys in the world, squats and bench presses, you know, you can compare me to them. But then, you know, we've got the best guy on the planet who just out totaled me on the same day by 100 kilograms. His name's Yuri Belkin. Wow. He's got a Shit. 400 and uh, he deadlifted 410 kilograms on the weekend. Jesus. So at, at the 110. At 110. Class, yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, I'll come up against him. You know, we're kind of side by side and then deadlift comes and it's it's. Yeah. Is and why is that? Why do you think that is? Uh, so there's a few things that they say, mm. and um, you know, in powerlifting, big bench press, small deadlift, and vice versa. Uh, it's the mechanics. It's the mechanics, and I mean, it doesn't. Um, not necessarily the case with everybody, but it certainly is for me. I feel like I've got pretty short arms, mm -hmm. which is a fantastic advantage for my bench press. Yep. Um, but when it comes to the deadlift, I, I watch some of the greatest deadlifters and I look at their technique and I'm like, yeah, I think I'm doing that. Then I look at my, my style when I compare my videos and I definitely bend down a lot further <laughs> to yeah. grab the bar. Um, I, I am traveling a little bit further, but it's not to say that I can't still improve my deadlift. Yep. But but definitely the best benches in the world, like I've got the best bench in Australia and I've got short arms. Like it's kind of, yeah. you know, that's what you'd expect to see. And, and the best deadlifters in the world also have fantastic mechanics yeah. for that movement. And same with the squatters, you know, yep. short femurs and, yep. and, and big round bellies. Yep. Um, so they bounce better and, yep. you know, yep. si yep. silly they things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so, so um, lucky that it's all come together and it doesn't really matter what you specialize in. But these days, yeah, everyone specializes in all three yeah that's that's who the best guys in the world are now and if you fail at one of them uh yeah well there'd be life. an element i guess there'd be an element of having the perfect genetics to, you know i mean definitely, at your definitely. level at your level genetics has to play a role absolutely you know, it does. like you kind of if you come up against someone with the perfect mechanic spread across all three of those lifts yeah you're, you're fucked, really. A absolutely, <laughs> you know? and, and yeah, as we're saying, the body shape and type and all of these things definitely uh, contributes massively. Yep. Um, but then you've got a lot of other attributes as well. Something that I, I've been thinking a lot about, and it's, it's, I guess it's a bit of a change of topic, but there's a lot, um, you guys know my wife, Felicia, and her sister, they've got a women's only Fitzbo, uh, you know, yep. account where they're, yep. um, right now there's a whole thing about Fitzbo being a really uh, negative term. Um, basically because it's giving the wrong image and basically telling people that it's unrealistic. <laughs> it's unrealistic lifestyle. Yep. Um, and, and people are looking up to, you know, the, the Lauren Simpsons, the Hattie Boydles of the world, um, who are basically live and breathe training yep. and it's kind of unachievable because everyone has jobs well yep. I guess it's the same on, on my end of the spectrum as well um, what I do for a living is I come into the gym after I drop off my daughter um, I have breakfast at my leisure straight after that I go do a poo have a shower train whenever I want yep. for as long as I want I've got a team of, of coaches and athletes that surround me through every single session yep. uh, no one gets in my way uh, and then after I, I'm, I'm a little bit tired I'll, I'll stop and I'll have my next meal waiting for me and then I'll rest a few hours and I'll come back and train in the afternoon it's it's yep. you know so you've got genetics um, then you've got the well I guess you, you could say hard work but it's not just the hard work I'm, I'm able to to put 100% of my focus into this, into which it. is a huge advantage. Yeah. But, but hang on, I've got to, I want to say, because this came up in conversation just yesterday when we were reflecting back after seeing you perform on the weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, people will say, oh yeah, you know, he's got good genetics or he's got this or he's got this great circle around him, but you fucking grinded. Like I, if we go back 12 years or 15 years when we made that, when you made that transition from mm -hmm. sort of kickboxing and martial arts into powerlifting, mm -hmm. When everyone else was into bodybuilding, I, mean, I was still training with your bro and uh, uh, at Fitness First, and we were all, you know, trying to be sort of mm. bodybuilder. I guess that's how we trained, yep. you know. Um, you know, you copped a bit of shit for going into powerlifting, and you did your time. Like you've done it day in, day out for the last twelve years. So there's a yeah. fuckload of grit and hard work that's gone into yeah. that. Yeah. And that's not just, just, you know, I guess discredit yeah um you've got to have all those pieces of the puzzle that come together and then it comes together in the perfect package mm -hmm. but you'll get to a point where you're at now i guess what what i'm saying is where the, you've got guys that are going to be anatomically gifted for deadlifting and it's going to be very hard for you to pull a 400 or a 420 off mm -hmm. the floor mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. definitely definitely but yeah thanks for for recognizing that yeah i've put my time in uh definitely you know you and i are the old buggers of the area i guess uh, yeah. you know all of us mm -hmm. you know 15 years in the industry um you know all from north sydney um, you know, we've, we've, and we've seen each other kind of, all, all of us grow together yeah. in our own different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I've, I've definitely put in my time. <laughs> and, yeah. and it hasn't happened overnight, that's for sure. Yeah, you know? yeah. But it's yeah. not just um, like what you said about, uh, you know, about the way that you train and you go to work and you eat and you train and then you mm -hmm. rest, eat again, train again. Mm -hmm. 
like that is a product of the way that you've steered your life yeah. to be to to create the results that you're creating now. And I was even I was having a chat to Richard just the other day, our, our other um, business partner, um, and we were talking about I was talking about how grateful I am that we now have this job where we we it's programmed into our day that we train twice a day. So we do strength training in the morning and mobility and movement in the afternoon. And I've had that dream for as long as I can remember. Like when I used to do Kung Fu and my teacher used to tell me how many hours a day you have to train to get better. And I used to think, well, how can I do that? Like I have to go to work from nine until six or whatever it is every day. And he said, look, Rad, this is what it takes to get good. I don't know how you do it, but if you want to get to where you want to be, this is what you got to do. And I could never, I could never train twice a day back then. It was just too hard to train before work and after work. So I used to train after work every day for anywhere from sort of two to four hours, but it was really hard to train for that long. So it, it is this whole lifestyle that you've created that's gotten you to where you are. And um, yeah, man, it's a testament. I mean, look at what you've just done on the weekend. It's unreal. You know? Thank you. It's yeah. awesome. This is, this is actually something I'd like to talk to you about and steer the conversation, if I may. I'd love to know what your rituals are like. Like we talk about this a lot here with our guys and yeah, you wouldn't know this, but our program now is five days a week. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember, I remember hearing either you or someone having a talk to your, uh, one of your clients whilst you were working in here a while, a few years ago. And you said, if you want to get decent results, you've got to train every day, brother. I remember you know? the conversation. I yeah. asked every one of the trainers here, yeah. how many days do you train? That's how exactly many do you right. train? Yeah. And everyone said five and six. Yeah, that's exactly right. Over yeah. the years, we've actually migrated to not giving people an option. If they want to come play here, it's a five day a week program. And we do also train on Saturday morning, but it's kind of an open mat where we train and we invite them to come in and train with us, you know. Um, you've like, cultivated this tribe which absolutely you would you would and this is something i talk about with our, our tribe here as well your tribe plays a big role in the energy and the type of training and and, and your motivation mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis can we talk a little bit about that because you that's one thing that you've done insanely well uh, if you want to get strong and you want to lift at your peak, there's no better way to train, no better place to train in Sydney because of this reason. Yeah. Let's talk about your tribe and the way you've built that. Yeah, so it's a lot of the things, it's, it's about the reputation that we've built um, based on, I guess, you know, doing our time, it's experience and, and, and leading by example. You know, I've trained uh, as you guys have, you know, you, you know, we work towards a goal and you achieve your goals and whatever. And then, and then, um, I started with social media, I guess after my wife did, and she developed a great name and a great business through her social media, and she kind of um, encouraged me to open an Instagram account, which I didn't want to do because I was, you know, I opened an account, I had no likes, I had no followers, and it's like, <laughs> this is sucks, boring, yeah. I post something and no one likes me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't have, I don't have, you know, a pretty hair and a nice bum. Yeah, you yeah. Know, well, I do, but I, only I think that, you know. <laughs> um, but, but uh, you know, slowly, slowly that grew, and, and I guess it was um, right time, right place kind of thing, where I was kind of one of the first people around the areas that were, like around North Sydney, or actually, in, I'll, I'll even go as far as to say, in Australia that was a coach as well as an athlete that that had a great product and that was promoting themselves through social media as well yeah so I was kind of one of the first to put themselves out there yep. and start building an audience and I started I actually started training professional athletes for free so my first professional athlete was an MMA fighter his name was uh, Ian Schaefer yep. I'm not sure if you guys have met him but um, you know, after I trained him, I got my next professional athlete who was Junior Talapau, who was a pro boxer, one of the best in Australia. Yep. And then from him, I had my next pro and my next pro and, and you know, powerlifters and boxers and rugby players. And, and it's mainly because, yeah, yeah, I, I will take a bit of credit that I was good at what I did, but I was probably one of the only ones known in the area that was doing it. You know, yep. I was known as the guy that was training the pros. So not many other people were known as that. So yep. where did these people go to? So they came to me. And then after that, um, you know, I opened my gym, a base gym, and I knew the end result. I knew what the picture that I wanted to paint was, and that was to be surrounded by the best guys on the planet. Yep. And I didn't know how it was going to happen, but I knew that there was advice that I was given by many people that were, you know, gym owners about, you know, capitalizing and overcapitalizing in gym equipment. Yep. And it was a huge decision that I've made, and obviously you guys have as well, and it was to spend lots and lots of money on the best equipment. So I got the best brands, I got Alico because I thought with my end result, the picture that I wanted to paint, it couldn't exist with anything less. Yep. Yep. So, you know, that was a huge 
a player in my success as a, you know as a leading strength coach was paying a lot of money yep. to have a premium facility mm. and all of a sudden you're standing next to an Alico facility with you know Watson dumbbells and the best equipment the money can buy yep. even if they didn't know my reputation people would look at me and say who's that guy yeah, I've got to yeah. go and train over there so yeah. if it wasn't if it wasn't my ability as a athlete, it could have been my, um, you know, me training all these professional coaches. And if it wasn't any of that, it was having the facility with the equipment that everyone needed. Yep. So it, I did everything that I could to attract all the right people. Yep. So that's, you know, a lot of it, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm not taking credit for being good at what I do uh, to some degree because a lot of it isn't necessarily how good I was, but it was how good I was marketing myself and the equipment that I that I used, it was attractive for a lot of people to come and train at my gym. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I also lived up to the reputation of, of the equipment and the social media presence and all of these things as well by, by putting in the time and busting my ass and being good at what I did yep. and, and achieving world-class results. So it all came together really nicely. And yep. now it's kind of, it's, it's good and bad. Um, but, you know, a lot of the great lifters want to come to me and train with me, which is my team now. I've got a great team of high-level athletes that are just all as strong and stronger than me. Mm. Um, and these are the people that push me on. They call me their coach, but they're also my coach as well. Mm. And, and that's a huge uh, part of my success as a lifter and a coach as well. It's just being surrounded by all of this. And it's just it's all kind of just growing in that direction. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but the, when I say it's good and bad, the bad part is it's very intimidating. And that's uh, something that you guys would know very well when you've got huge you know, guys all, you know, with muscles and lifting crazy weights. Um, from a money-making perspective, a lot of people wouldn't step foot in my doors yeah. because it is just far too intimidating and I'm aware of that. And, yeah. uh, but that's, that's the niche that I've got and that's the life that I like to live. And um, you know, I'm, I'm able to make money through different means now than just gym memberships. And if it was my only um, means of income, gym memberships, uh, I, I'd be bust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, look, yeah. you've, you've kind of got the blueprint that, w that I read about in books, you know, like I follow Gary Vee, who we spoke about before we came live. Uh, and you, you, you're doing exactly what you're passionate about. Yeah. You're effectively living your passion, yeah. you know. And because of that, you're fucking good at it because you love you. going to work every day, you yeah. know. And you also uh, have, yeah, you've, you've, you've marketed it well. I mean, he talks about documenting the process. And when yeah. you think about it, you did that perfectly. Like yeah. if you throw back to 15 years or 12 years ago, Walker Street lifting days, <laughs> You guys document, you documented daily, yeah. everything, you yeah. know, and it was your wins, your losses, your missed lifts. Like not a lot of people, you know, if you look at their Instagram feed, and this is what I really, really um, love about you guys, you document irrespective of whether you, you document when you learn, you know, and if that's a failed lift, then you talk about it and you yeah. say, this fucking sucked. It felt yeah. like shit. This is why, you know, mm -hmm. it's not just, oh, here's all my perfect shit. Mm -hmm. Look at how awesome I am. You mm -hmm. know, you do, you're doing everything. And mm -hmm. that's, I guess, the perfect formula, you know, it's just documenting the process. Yeah. So it's interesting that you, I guess that term has been coined, uh, you know, as you're saying, I'm documenting the process and that's a marketing strategy that's been promoted or a blueprint that's been promoted by, you know, it, you know, legends. Of, of this field such as Gary Vee yep. um, something interesting is we had a uh, you know we get all sorts of people that walk into our gym and inquire about memberships and I had this one lady who said to me um, I follow your shit and I really want to be part of it I'm like cool so do you lift and she said no I'm in marketing I don't want to be part of the lifting I just want to know um, your strategy behind your marketing yeah. and I'm just intrigued by this this whole thing that you've got going on I'm like Wow. Ma marketing no 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 there's none of that i, I lift i lift i record i post yeah yeah good or as you say good or bad that's it's just documenting what i'm doing and yeah. i guess it's kind of done by accident uh, but that's that's right that's what i do i document it and yep. um you know a lot of the, the reasons why i post a lot of the things that i post it's like okay i, I want to know where i was this time last year you yep. know i need to compare myself you know six weeks out four weeks out eight weeks out um, so that I can see if I'm improving yep. and that's the best way. I'll just scroll back to my last competition yeah. uh, and, and, and I'll see the dates and I'll watch the videos and, yep. and that, that's the best way of comparing myself to myself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, it just, it all works, you know, whether it's for, for marketing purposes, for my own documenting, which helps me, me train myself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's all coming together and it's just so happens to be, you know, as, uh, the perfect strategy, the, the perfect strategy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want to jump in here because this more, this week is our testing week in unity and what we do 
we're rolling out this initiative where we document. Uh, mm -hmm. So once a month, we, we test the, we, we don't do one RMs with our guys, we do three RMs, because mm -hmm. we want to try and encourage them to only do one RMs a few times a year, just because of how physically taxing it is. A lot of these guys break otherwise. Yeah. Uh, they don't have quite the balance that we do, where they get enough sleep and all that sort of thing, mm -hmm. the recovery strategies. But we do our three RMs, and I want to just shout out to all the guys that are that are doing that, that are watching this or that do watch this. It, the doc, Rad was like, "Come on, you got to get your phones out. You got to film this. Don't just write it down what you're mm -hmm. lifting, da da da." Because filming, mm -hmm. you know, you get uh, you get to see technique, mm -hmm. you get to see your body position, you get to see how you know bar speed, all that sort of thing on a certain lift. So. Yeah, it's cool. It's really, really nice to hear that you guys are finding that so powerful as well. And that's it's, how you use yeah, it. Yeah, powerful in many ways, you know, for, for marketing and, and social media and all this. But whenever I teach people, I teach people to be their own harshest critic as well. Yeah. So a lot of the times, for example, when I will do a lift, I'll turn around and I'll ask all of my, my wonderful team members how it looked. And everyone wants to give me a pat on the back. Yep. It's just human nature. They just want to be nice. So I don't do that anymore. I feel myself and I, I'm the, my own harshest critic. Yeah. And I know... Yeah. I'm not looking for, yeah, good boy, bad boy. I'm looking for your knee went out, your knee didn't go out, your, your chest dropped, your eyes dropped, your feet were... What's you the 1% you can fix? 1% at yeah. a time. And, and I do it every single time. I, each and every warm-up rep, um, you know, I've got a lot of new philosophies that, that I guess I've, I've kept a lot of them since I've known you guys. Um, but basically, something I talk about is you've got to earn the right to add weight to the bar. Yep. Something that a lot of people don't know about me is I actually hate lifting heavy weights. <laughs> yeah, so I try and find ways to make it feel light. Yep. And everything is technique, technique, technique. So the, the older I'm getting, the smarter I'm getting, um, and it comes from experience in being injured, and I don't want that anymore. Yep. I hate being broken. It sucks, and you can't get strong that way. Yep. And so I did one really vicious injury on the weekend, um, I tore my callus on my pinky on the deadlift. <laughs> so that's, that's, my, that's my big injury um, that I've done my whole prep leading up to this. I can zoom in. Can you zoom in on it? Yeah, it's yeah, it's pretty vicious. I don't horrible. know if it's suitable for your viewers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> up on that camera there. Yeah. Oh, mate. That's yeah. savage. Yeah. 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 Did uh, Felicia give you a kiss for that one? Oh, she didn't because she didn't want to catch whatever <laughs> I had on there. So <laughs> I, I, quick, just quickly, there's a really good lead in here that is one of the topics that I wanted to talk about. Um, and this is something that you guys, like our style of training, other than the fact that we do barbells and body weight, uh, you're, you, we both keep it fairly simple in that mm -hmm. regard. Like you look around, there's no fancy equipment and machinery here. Mm -hmm. We like to keep it simple. But the one thing we have very in common, at least I think so from an outsider's um, perspective looking in is, that we do something that actually hijacks a very um, intrinsic mechanism in the brain, which is using something other than body image as a primary goal mm -hmm. for our motivation. We use, we use movement mm -hmm. and strength, mm -hmm. and so do you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd love to talk about that a little bit because I think that's something we can really add value to people that are watching. Um, finding your intrinsic motivator, because you tapped on it there, you are your harshest critic, yeah. and it's always at the end of the day, you versus you, yeah. you know? Even though you go and compete on a national level like you just did on the weekend, when you're in the training camp, you're not, I mean, I don't know about you, and I'd love to hear your, your viewpoint on this. Are you thinking, shit, I've got to beat this guy, or are you thinking I've got to beat myself? <laughs> There's a lot of strategies when it comes to competition, whether you're competing against the person or competing against yourself, and I've done all of them. Um, and something that, you know, when it comes to competition, your objective is to win. And a lot of people do say you need to beat the opponent and whatever it is. But I find that my most successful results that I've ever achieved with myself and with my athletes is to definitely have a plan. Um, and something that always goes through my head is, is a term that I saw Joe DeFranco say. It was one of his t-shirts and it's a guy with his hand up like that saying, fuck plan B. And that's kind of what's going through my head. Yep. Um, just stop changing your mind. Like it, it, your mind races in the heat of, of competition. I, you know, it's feeling like this, should I change my strategy? So this is the first time that I ever um, achieved a nine from nine day yep. since my very first competition. My first competition ever was nine from nine. And that was, I forget, it was probably about eight, eight or nine, uh, about eight years ago. And I, I did a 630 kilogram total in the 93 kilogram class. Um, and I got nine from nine because I had a plan and I stuck to the plan because I didn't know what else to expect. I'd, I'd never done it before. So I thought, here's, here's the numbers that I think I can do. Let's just go and do that and see how it pans out. Yeah. That's the first 
time I ever got a nine from nine day, and this was the second time, excuse me, I ever got a nine from nine day, and I stuck to the process, and it was the best, um, the best total ever yeah. done in Australia. Yeah. Uh, and same with a lot of my athletes. It's like they call me that you know if I'm never, ever not at a competition, and they're messaging me and they're sending me their videos, and they're saying you know it felt like it felt like this. Should I change the plan? Stick to the freaking plan. Yep. Stick to the freaking plan. I don't care who's in the room. I know what you can get. This is your best chance of achieving the best total. You try and compete against those people, you're probably going to do something silly and you're not going to achieve it. So, so it's, it is, that's just my strategy. I'm not saying it's the winning strategy uh, or it's the best strategy. I just know that I've had the most success with, as you say, competing against yourself. Um, uh, I th yeah, but there's, there's a few other things that you just spoke about. And I think I've well, where did the motivation come from, Bass? Because, like, you know, for anyone that doesn't know you, like, you're, you're one of the most passionate people I've ever met. And people say to me that I'm an extremely passionate person. And honestly, I don't think I even rank next to you <laughs> with my passion for things. And that's a, that's a uh, compliment. No, I take it as I a mean, big compliment. I, reckon... I, know, I know you very well, Rad, <laughs> so I do take that as a big compliment. Well, I, I believe people say to me, you're passionate. And I say, no, I'm not passionate. I'm obsessive. Yeah. I'm an obsessed person. And I would say the same about you. Definitely. And I don't use the word obsessed as a negative way at all. People yeah. always talk about obsession as being a bad thing. Yeah. And I think it's a really good thing because I think if you're not obsessed about something, you're never going to get really good about it. And I'm not the only person that said that. There's great people in a lot of fields that agree with that. And um, where do you think that your obsession with powerlifting came from? What made you decide to go from what you were doing before at Fitness First that Yanni was talking about to go to this what was what was that motivation that got you there i've always wanted to be good at things you know and i'm very competitive and and i always wanted to be better than uh you know um, everyone i guess mm. um uh, within reason there's certain things that i know that i've got I trained a lot of athletes that i'll never come close to i train the strongest man on the planet and that's completely uh that's Thor but from uh, Game of Thrones, right? The, the mountain that's from Game Thor of Beyonce, Thrones. Yeah. Mountain from Game of Thrones. Yeah, very separate. That's someone you just don't compare yourself to. Yeah. Uh, that's impossible. Yeah. You know, they say impossible is nothing. Well, it, you won't, you yeah. won't see me do the things that Thor <laughs> yeah. does in this lifetime yeah. or the next. Yeah. Um, but, but um, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I guess like a lot of people have competitive nature. Yep. Um, and, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's an OCD. I don't know what it is. I think I'm kind of uh, level-headed. I think I'm mm. normal to an extent. Yeah. Um, but I just like being good at things and, yeah. and whenever I find something I, I guess I understand what it takes to be good at something and a lot of people like for example a lot of people that aren't good at things uh, get bored easily yeah uh, you know they don't understand yeah. that to be good at things it requires repetition and and a lot of boring um, yeah. It's boring, movements. same shit over and over again. Yeah, yeah so yeah. the Bruce Lee saying, I don't fear the man who has practiced 10,000 different kicks. I fear the man who's practiced one kick 10,000 times. Yeah. And that's something that I do right now. If you ever look at my exercise vocabulary, it's very, very, very small. Mm. Uh, you know, we, very, we specify in... in um, Obviously, the powerlifting movements, but there's also a lot of other movements as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not just a powerlifter, we mm -hmm. I like to have a strong, injury-free body that's structurally balanced and mm -hmm. moves well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that does have a huge carryover to powerlifting, but it also has a huge carryover to all strength sports. If mm -hmm. you give me a body like a rugby player, as you know, a few of the rugby players that I've coached, um, I don't know the sport. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I'll ask them just you know conversation sake. Mm. Oh, what position do you play? And they'll tell me, and it's like. Yeah, I don't know. Like I care. <laughs> like I know the difference between yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, but they love that. All of the people that I, um, the, the high level rugby players, they appreciate that. Yeah. And they know that, that it doesn't matter whether I know their position or not because mm. they're not with me to teach them how to play rugby, for example. Yeah. My MMA fighters, I don't teach them how to fight. Yeah. They're with me because they know that I know how to get them strong and injury free and, mm. and moving well mm. and structurally balanced. Mm. And if you get a strong injury free body and yeah. put it in any playing field and practice the shit out of your sport with that body, mm -hmm. it's a fantastic head start. Yeah. Um, but I think, sorry, this is moving from topic to topic. That's what it was that you did suggest was um, my motivation, it's not the mirror. Yeah. And I've changed from that, um, that, that is absolutely right. Um, and, and that's same with uh, my, my wife's mantra as well. And it's, I guess it's all the same system. Yeah. Uh, but theirs is a female only. And we take a lot of people from the mirror uh, because it's very subjective. What you see in the mirror um, can, can ruin everything. Like for example, with my lifts, I see a big ugly guy with his eyeballs popping out 
uh, you know, telling me that that's too heavy for him. So yeah. I'll dump the bar because it's like that guy's struggling. Yeah. Uh, so I can't look at the mirror when I lift. It's it doesn't. We work. actually just quickly a quick side note. I'll jump out. When Bass used to train here at uh, at Unity, we installed a blind that he could hmm. pull down in front of the mirrors. Yeah. Uh, which is like taking this to a whole new degree, I guess. And, and we kind of, one of the main reasons why we put mirrors in the gym here at all is because we wanted to make the place look bigger. It was a design um, install, not uh, so that we could stare at ourselves in the mirror. You know, the place is kind of small. We wanted to make it look bigger and it was suggested by a, a, an interior designer. Um, but this is like, I guess it's, it's, something, it's something that we try and teach people because you, you said it really well, um, body image is subjective. Yes. And you're never going to look like the person you want to look like. Never. You just can't, you know. Because yeah, perfect and doesn't exist. Exactly. And at some point along the way, it becomes unmotivating mm -hmm. because you try, you try, you try. And unless you're gen like genetically gifted, you're never going to stand, you know, there's, there's an element of genetics that mm -hmm. allows someone to stand on stage and look amazing, Absolutely. you know. Uh, irrespective of, I mean, they fucking train for it to stand at that caliber, mm -hmm. but you know, if you like the 99% of the people out there aren't going to achieve that. And so what we've found, and it's interesting because you guys have achieved a very high level of fitness. We found that, uh, finding your intrinsic motivator, mm -hmm. which usually it's easier to find, to, to relate it back to movement, to strength, to perf physical performance mm -hmm. and how the body feels as opposed to how it looks necessarily. Mm -hmm. On that note though, you don't, we're not, like I, um, what's the documentary on Netflix with the, the English dude who was the heaviest, the, the strongest deadlifter in the world for a little while? Eddie Hall. Eddie Hall. I, I, I watched Still the documentary. Is, Loved that documentary. Yeah. You know, when you watch powerlifters and, and the world's strongest men, they're usually big dudes. And I don't mean big just in muscular terms. You said it before, they got big bellies and they got a certain physique. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you, you've never really looked, you've never looked like that. You've always been probably the leanest, really successful powerlifter I've ever seen. Yeah. Is that something that you specifically do? Um, yeah, definitely. Well, the, the, if, you, if you look at, if, it depends who you're comparing be, to. Because so. I'm sure it would be easier to be fat. It is very easy to be fat. <laughs> You'd think it's easier to get fat, but actually walking around with a big gut. Yeah. If you, like I, I've actually, um, I'm lucky enough that I've got a lot of friends that are over 150 kilograms now. Yeah. Uh, up to 200 kilograms is my heaviest friend. Yeah. None of them are comfortable. Yeah, right. Okay, so it's easy to, to put on a certain amount of fat, but then to get to that level, that's not easy. That's a yeah, full-time job. Yeah, right, absolutely. Um, and so I don't know, if, uh, so because you did mention Eddie Hall, he, he um, recently put up a post of him just before he delivered 500 kilograms without his T-shirt. Yep. And he, he, he actually, I, I should put this just in case Eddie ever finds me in the street. <laughs> he, he's not one of the dudes I was referring to. He's actually quite muscular. Yeah. No. No, he's Eddie, not. Eddie Hall. Is he not? No, no, no. He's round. Oh, really? Yeah. He's a big ball. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah, no, he's, yeah, yeah. He's not muscular. That's the that's the British guy with the yeah, yeah, yeah. Record. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. He's, I he's thought not I saw. Absolutely he's got muscle. Outside. Yeah. He, he's got muscle and he's got a whole heap of fat. Yep. And the the post that he, I'm referring to, he put up was him with his t-shirt oh, on. Oh, of course. Yeah. And he basically. He said on it, um, this is me at, he talks in stones, but yep. whatever it was, it, 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 um, it equates to about 195 kilograms. This yep. is me at 195 kilograms. I don't wish this upon my worst enemy. Yeah, right. Right. And so, and, and I can vouch for it, not from my own um, experience, but the athletes that I train, like the, the biggest athlete that I've been the closest with, I've got Thor. Who they have the CPAP devices, you know, they have sleep apnea. Yep. Um, they, they can't sleep very yeah, well. Right. They're too big. Yep. Uh, and then another guy who's Alex the God, Simon. So yep. we, we got him to. So he's you an know, absolute beast. He's a beast. I met him at about 130 kilograms when he was 18 years old. Yep. Uh, oh, sorry, he was 17 years old. Anyhow, we took him to number one in Australia, uh, strongest guy in Australia on his very second powerlifting competition. He weighed 180 kilograms wow. and he didn't like anyone. Wow. Yeah. He didn't like anyone. He was so angry because he had no sleep. Yeah. He, he was, he felt sick. Yep. Couldn't move. He was yep. uncomfortable. Um, you know, so, so that's, that's, really that's the extremes though. Yeah, of course. But the other thing is I had to talk to my guys <laughs> I, 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 every once in a while, cause I, I have the, um, the, the job of training the guys who do our foundations, um, program, which is really laying the foundations for them to mm -hmm. work with barbells and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, one of the big things I, we, we cover is nutrition yep. in that, you know, and, and I, my, my theory, because I've gone from 78 kilos to 92 kilos mm -hmm. of like lean, I was about a 10 or 11% body fat at that stage by DEXA, and I've always 
felt that, and now I'm back down to like 84, I've always felt that it's, it's, it's more work to get big because it fucking costs a lot of money. Yeah. Like if, to get lean and, and to lose weight, yes, it's just discipline and it requires work, but effectively you save a lot of money. Like at the end of the day, when you peel back the layers, it's just the work. But to get really muscular and any, I, I'm sure you got a bunch of bodybuilders down at your gym as well and you're friends with them and powerlifters. And these guys, like I've watched, anyone who hasn't seen it, watch the documentary on the world's strongest men and look at how much they have to fucking put into their bodies to, yeah. to maintain that level of strength and performance. There, yeah. There's a lot of fuel going through that body and it doesn't come cheap. It's a lot of fuel. It doesn't come cheap. Like living with Thor... You know, we live with him, I've done it three times for 2016, 17 and 18, World's Strongest Man. We lived together for six weeks of the year. We brought my family down as well and my wife was um, cooking the food. We'd go and do the groceries. Wow, He's yeah. spending thousands of dollars yeah. a week just on food. Yep. The highest quality meat. So he's very different. So now, you know, that's number one on the planet. Um, and a lot of people think that it's just calories. Uh, you know, I've, yep. I've heard people say there's no such thing as a bad calorie. Yep. That's at the highest level and it's like, I disagree, and, and actually I've learned a lot about eating high-quality food yep. through Thor. Yeah, well. So, you know, this is a bit of a shameless plug. So Thor uh, follows Stan Efferding's uh, vertical diet. Yep. Um, it's a bit of a fad at the moment, it seems, because it's very popular, but it's popular because it works. Uh, not only does it work uh, because of the nutrition that you're getting in, but it's also... Uh, the digestibility of the food that they're eating it's not easy to consume the amount of calories that these guys need to consume absolutely you know these guys are between 8,000 up to 12,000 calories a day yeah I don't know if, if the, the viewers at home understand what that means but yeah, that, that means you pretty much have a fork in your hand and in your face all day long 24 7 yeah and you know the digestibility of the food and it needs to be high quality food because if you're full you just can't eat and yep. if you're feeding yourself crap that causes inflammation in your guts yep. uh, and you're bloated you don't want to eat anymore so yep. it's not just as easy as just eating dirty calories yeah. um, they're eating high quality food and that's that's something that I've done in the last uh, you know since knowing Thor is um, white rice yep. and and minced beef yep. is probably the staple and, and chicken stock with spinach and copious amounts of salt. Yep. That's probably the staple of my nutrition. You know, I do eat other things as well. I do eat my greens and I do eat, um, you know, other type. I eat oats, other types of carbohydrates. I eat a lot of, uh, I, I drink a lot of uh, cranberry juice and orange juice. These are all things that are not just like, you know, dirty calories or, or uh, meaningless calories. You need carbohydrates yeah, yeah, to yeah. fuel uh, the workloads that you're going to be performing. Absolutely. Um, you know, but you need all of this food to be able to digest. And that's the beauty of eating something like this yep. is you, you have a meal. Uh, and you're not full. Walking around bloated and full, that's not actually a good thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the biggest powerlifters and all these big strong guys that just want to get big and fat and round, they've got it kind of wrong. Yeah. So, you know, as, as you said, you know, it was a nice compliment that you said that I was one of the leanest guys uh, of the powerlifters that you've seen. Um, if you look at the guys at the highest level that compete in a weight class, yep. Often the best guys are shredded. Yeah, good. Because you need muscle to move the weight. Yeah, uh, But it's, it's the... the the weight class is when it's you know 140 kilogram and Above, up. Yep. Uh, that's the super heavy weights. That's when you know a little bit of extra weight, whether it's fat or muscle, is actually going to help. You yep. know the way that yep. you bounce, the way that your hamstrings press against the, your calves at the bottom of a squat and bounce you up, for example. Yep. Your big gut to hold you upright and protect your core. That yep. that does help. But when you're in a weight class, actually the best guys on the planet are shredded. Yeah, that's interesting, and that's I guess that's a really good thing to plug too because we 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 do like to promote health, and I guess at an at a, an elite level. Uh, powerlifting, I mean, at an elite level with any sport, let's be real, health is often sacrificed for performance, mm -hmm. you know, not, mm -hmm. and this is something I tell, I, I, I've, I've argumented many a time, elite level athletes aren't necessarily healthy, you know, they, they make huge sacrifices for their performance mm -hmm. and for their sport, mm -hmm. you know. But I had a really interesting conversation with a friend who's a professional bodybuilder who was a, uh, an, an Olympia bodybuilder mm -hmm. um, and he maintained around 140 kilo physique all year round and he was about your height. Um, and he sort of said to me once, which I thought was interesting, you, uh, to be a professional bodybuilder or an a, a, a athlete at that level, sometimes the genetics that come into play are just the robustness of your digestive system. Yeah. You know, because yeah. you get to a point where you've, you've 
put so much shit through your body that your digestive system is often the first thing that fails yeah. at that level. Yeah. And when your digestive system fails, you're fucked because you stop digesting the food properly, you stop absorbing nutrients. And he was, um, this is um, Ben Pekoski, just in case you're watching, mate, shout out to you. Awesome dude. He was really meticulous about the food he put in his body. And he used to say, I think, I think I remember him saying to me once, it cost him about $70,000 a year to maintain his physique, yeah. you know. Um, Just from nutrition alone. Yeah, nutrition yeah, and supplementation and all right. that sort of thing, yep. you know. Uh, and... And he, and he, you know, he used to say, look, I am very full, like I eat, I try and put as much organic through as I can. I try and reduce the toxic load. I, I, and, and he was very, he was amazing at, yeah. but a lot of the other bodybuilders didn't, yeah. you know, but I have se se um, seen guys come and go. And he used to say, one of the biggest reasons why you see bodybuilders just disappear all of a sudden is either through injury or internal injury. You know, their bodies just yeah. go fuck pack out. They can't do it anymore. Yeah. You know, they get IBS or whatever else it is and their body stops processing the amount of fuel it's going yeah. through so it's you know? like at that level and it depends on the sport um you know but the supplementation that um you may or may not have been referring to it does destroy the body a lot yeah um you know and, and the gut health um at that level it's it's absolutely not good for you yeah yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And, and and the thing is that you are saying that at the highest level it's not necessarily healthy and you are absolutely correct um you know the best athletes in the world at whatever sport it is niche Mm. They are unbalanced. They don't have, you know, a lot of the things like family, much family time or, or they don't really enjoy a lot of the nice things in life yep. uh, because they are obsessed with the sport. And that's whether you call that healthy or not, that's, that's what people want to do. Um, but actually, I, I think the people are turning to this whole thing of health mm. because with an unhealthy body, you get sick. When you're sick, you can't perform. So, so if you disregard health completely um you're doing yourself a disservice absolutely yeah. yeah i look man i reckon what you've just said there is a really important thing to touch on and for the audience to understand when you're looking at instagram or when you're looking at youtube or when you're watching professional athletes um and trying to compare yourself to them it you just cannot understand the amount of work that goes into it like the amount of work that goes into what Yanni, Richard and I do is far more than what the average person is in. And that is not even close to what someone like you does because I'm not trying to compete in anything. I'm just trying to be the best that I can be for myself. And even still, I'm doing things that the average person isn't willing to do. But what you just spoke about there about, you know, the load that it puts on your body to perform at this level, I think a lot of people out there are really unrealistic with their goals when they look at what um, they, 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 they decide, okay, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to start doing this, so I'll, I'll start working out like this guy, but they don't understand everything that goes into it. They don't understand the, um, you know, and you even touched on it before, how you said this Fitspo thing is getting a negative connotation, which is, which is really sad because I, I don't know that it should. Like if you want to... If you want to devote your life to something like this and be be obsessed with it, then do it. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. we do and we mm -hmm. love it. Mm -hmm. But if you're not willing to devote your life to it, don't compare yourself to the people exactly. that are at the top. Exactly. Don't, and don't ever think that you're ever going to be there and, and let, your, um, let your actions meet your expectations, yeah. Yeah. you know, because... It's not like it's not like you should say, well, I'm never going to be that person, so I may as well not do anything for yeah. my health and fitness and movement. Because if you if all you could dedicate was an hour a day and you could just try and eat better food than you're eating now, you're still going to be infinitely times better than if you don't sure. do that, right? For sure. Um, yeah, it's a it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because we do get that a lot, and um, you, you you know you get people saying, oh, well, you can't train like that, so you know that's so stupid. But it's it's not the way you should be going through life. It is, and it does take a lot of experience to understand what it actually does take to achieve these levels of success. Mm. And it is funny, <clears throat> I guess you guys must see it so many times. You you've got um, access to a lot of people that are just starting out in in whatever their pursuit to health or strength or fitness or whatever it is, and the goals that they're setting themselves. I mean, you guys and I know um, <clears throat> what's achievable and how many people come in with un realistic goals and it's like mm. yeah it's, it's, it's not just that <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not let's just, just get that. started with a few little things what, first what yeah. i what i used to find really uh mind-boggling was when i would see guys coming in that that did want to try to lift as much weight as possible mm -hmm. but all they could dedicate to it was coming into the gym an hour a day and they got so many injuries yeah. and you think man you, you like you might be looking at people like bass on um, Facebook and looking at the lifts that he does but you don't realize the work that goes into it in the background and you've got to respect 
the time that it takes to be able to get to this level and the amount of work and the amount of sacrifice and the nutrition and the recovery and you know the massages that you get and, and the support and around, the support around it. yeah exactly 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 just, um, just while, while we're on that give uh, give the massage therapist a quick plug because he's just jumped on and um, that's dr phil dr phil. Yeah, phil, phil phil white i've been seeing that guy actually since you guys recommended him to me yeah. um and that was only by by accident my my original massage therapist wasn't aware Away. but no was away yeah i and remember it was, it was remember. quite lucky that they were away because it was a it was a girl and i think my wife probably preferred that i didn't get massaged yeah. by a girl yeah. um and then anyway so it ended up being dr phil yeah um, who's in north sydney and and he's been keeping my body intact um since you guys introduced me to him probably you know four years ago or something like that yeah, yeah. um maybe more it could have been five no it would have been would have been probably five i reckon yeah. it would have been right near this when we started yeah the gym. and and i've yeah. been especially up to comp prep time and that's yeah. a huge part of my success in my movement is that mm. i can actually move yeah um mm. and without you know the weekly massage it's probably uh, wouldn't have happened as no, well. No, no so, way. So yeah, shout out to, to Dr. Philzy, you're the man. Yeah, the man. it's the, look, it's the same. I, I'd yeah. say it's the same with me, um, Bass. Even even when I'm not even competing, just to be able to do what I do, I um, I see Phil when I can, and I also see Tom and Angus, the chiropractors yeah. down there. Um, for me, my biggest problem is my lower back. I've got issues with my lower back, yeah. and um, the ridiculous amount of sand that just accumulates in his vagina. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, brotherly love yeah, brotherly love of course um, you wouldn't think that I was the one that was in the army but anyway. um, so uh, yeah man like the you just you just can't do it can you when you're training the amount that we train and you're not like if you didn't have someone that was really good that was working on your body every week like Phil or any of the guys down at Cartwright Physical Therapy you just um, yeah, I don't know how I'd do it. <laughs> yeah, so it's a big part of it. It's not just the training, and, and that's what people don't get. It's yeah. the little things as well to maintain your health, and that's part of health. Yeah. Um, you know, it's to keep your body injury-free and, and moving correctly. Mm. Um, nutrition, rest, yeah. you know, the, the dumb things like, are you getting eight hours of sleep? But when you when you get to the level that you've got, like we've talked, Yanni talked about this road that you've been on, and, and I mean, we've all been on, on these, these journeys. Like you said, you know, Yanni and I have been on a journey. You know, we've all been doing this for... For, for 20 years or whatever if you count all the training that we've yeah. done the, the older you get and the more you get into it the more you realize that the shit that you paid off when you started was is, is actually some of the most important stuff yeah. like taking care of your body getting enough sleep yeah. putting the right nutrition in so that you can go and compete and the worst injury that you get is a callus <laughs> being torn because because if you go back in time that wasn't what was happening you know you're getting really bad injuries that are coming up all the time yeah i thought i thought injury was part of it yeah i thought um you know the whole no pain no gain thing is is just my life that I chose to live because I yep. was tough and hardcore but uh, there's nothing tough or hardcore about the, the way I choose, make my decisions anymore yeah uh, and same with my athletes as well if anything's slightly going to hurt anybody we eliminate it immediately um, and and the exercises that I used to think is what hurt me are the ones that I use to fix people yeah so for example someone comes to me with a back injury the first thing I'm going to do is teach them how to bend over and pick things up mm. and strengthen their movement and the best exercise for that is a deadlift mm. and that's one of the exercises that's being poo-pooed by a lot of you know therapists that don't actually understand the movement mm. uh, because a lot of injuries come from incorrectly performed deadlifts or incorrectly mm. performed any movement in the gym yeah, man. actually and you know it's, it's funny that you say that bass because one of the well what you know we're still talking about um phil here and and uh our uh, um our practitioners that work on our bodies one of the reasons why i love phil and tom and the guys down at uh, cartwright physical therapy are that they do exercise themselves yeah. yeah. and i've we we have our members that go and see physios and uh they come back and they tell me oh i i can't train for three weeks why not oh well the physio told me i've got to lay on the ground and mm -hmm. practice you know this and that and it's i just slap my hand on my head and lay think, on the ground and be weak and sedentary yeah, which is yeah. what interests most people in the first exactly place. exactly <laughs> yeah it's a it's a big thing isn't it to to understand the way that the body moves if you're going to be prescribing exercise for rehab and uh and for things like that well the best physiotherapists out there are ones that prescribe exercise and movement and hmm and uh, corrective strengthening uh, movements yeah. to, to help people get better. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yanni, you had a, you had a question you were gonna, uh, oh, oh, Yanni's typing, uh, no, typing on no, Facebook. He's re re responding, responding, to, responding to all the comments here. The, uh, Man, look, that's, um, 
Uh, mate, it's been an awesome chat. We're getting some great feedback on Facebook here. There's some of our uh, old members. Shout out to Tom Slezak there um, mm. for, your, for your comment, mate. Good to see you on there. Uh, he's one of our old members. I know um, Tom. Yeah, yeah Tom. Tom. Yeah, yeah. How are you, Tom? Tom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, mate, it's been unreal. It's, uh, you know, for me, um, you know, I've, y- Yanni's obviously been friends with you for longer than I have because Yanni was working at Walker Street and at Fitness First with you when I was up at St. Leonard's. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when we became friends five years ago, when I got out of the army, oh, six years ago now, when I got out of the army and we were all still back at Fitness First, like watching um, how far you've come and being part of that journey, you know, having you here as a trainer for, for a year or however long you were here and then watching you go on open base gym, it's just been unreal, you know, it's been, a, it's been so cool the way that both of our businesses have grown and grown and to see you win this competition on the weekend <laughs> it's just been unreal that's why i was so excited to get you in here because i um even even though we've been a kilometer away we've been on the other sides of north sydney i've been watching the journey and i feel like i've been a part of it um and it's just it's so cool man to uh to see where you've uh where you've come and what you've achieved in the years and yes yeah, thank you and you guys have definitely been a big part of my journey um you know in so many ways obviously you guys had me up here and i was working here uh you guys motivated me a lot with with the styles of gym and taught me a lot about uh, how to run a gym as well you know through working mm. so closely with you guys mm. um, you know if you look around at this gym it's very similar to the to the style of gym that I have as well it's pretty mm. much the same thing mm. and, and I learned a lot about running the business side of things through you guys as well and although we do run separate types of businesses you know you guys have been a huge uh, part of my journey and, and my success today so thank you guys so much for that and a funny thing as well is yeah even back at fitness first a lot of people you know will, will poo poo uh, commercial gyms and i think it's a bit funny and i'll probably uh, if i had a choice i really wouldn't i'd prefer not to train in a commercial gym over the styles of gym that i have today but you know that's that's my my blueprint as well you know 10 years at fitness first before i started here and a lot of people you know upcoming let's just say you know switch to the audience of the personal trainers out there if there are any watching yep uh, you know it is a great place to start and it's what yeah, you know man, started you guys is, in this so direction good. This yeah. is absolutely, I mean, I, this, people say this all the time, I have exactly the same opinion. I did 10 years at Fitness First and I wouldn't be where I am today mm-hmm. without it, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was not easy, mm-hmm. you know, because you, you stand out, there's 35 other trainers there and you've got to hustle. Mm-hmm. But for fuck's sake, man, like it's a platform to launch you. There's one other thing I'd like to tip on that you said you brushed over before and it falls into that whole um, Gary Vaynerchuk eat shit before you before you talk the shit, you know. Uh, you trained a lot of your professional athletes for free. You didn't yep. take money off them at first to, yep. to expand into that market, you know. And at that level, you weren't a, 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 a trainer that was struggling to bring clients on. You know, you, I had a you book. were I had a full, you book, had of a full book of They're clients. They're all paying me. And that's, but that's, that's a, it's a funny thing, but that's probably why I was able to do that. You know, and a lot of people that were giving me the advice of not, you know, you, you got to make money for every, you know, for your time and you're, you're more valuable than this and they're going to respect you if you charge them. Um, for me, it wasn't about the money. For me, it was initially about I was into martial arts before I became a powerlifter. And I'll, I'll just make this very clear. I wasn't a very good martial artist, which is why I, I turned to powerlifting. But uh, that's that was my interest and I loved it. And I something that I saw in Australia was there wasn't a huge amount of Australian successful high-level powerlifters. When I... Uh, uh, martial artists yep uh what i mean by high level i mean ones that were actually getting paid yeah and that was a big disadvantage so if you're not getting paid how can you pay for you know personal trainers or to live the lifestyle that we're talking about where you get to train and you get the luxury to be able to train at your leisure yep. multiple times per day and recover and be fed and and have these people uh, help surrounding you helping you and, and it just didn't exist so it was kind of me trying to give back because i love martial artists and i was friends with these guys and i wanted to give back and i thought what if I could save these guys money and give them the great strength work that's the the most that I could contribute to these guys was a free strength coach and that was kind of me trying to do right by by Australian martial arts you know Uh, so that's actually where it came from it wasn't just because I wanted to build my reputation that's just what came as a result of it I didn't need to build my reputation as the man who trained uh, professional athletes yeah um you know I just wanted to help these guys because there was a need for it and then it just changed and then you just nailed the whole thing on the head again perfectly with absolute symmetry which is to give without expectations of receiving you know and I think this is something that trainers can learn from because 
fuck it's accelerated us and you know we've only just got to the stage pretty much this year really where we tr we now allocate four hours a day to our training two in the morning two in the afternoon mm -hmm. we have very select times where we allow ourselves to train clients we don't take clients on outside of those times mm -hmm. so gone are the days where people can call you up and say oh i need to move my session to 10 a.m mm. that's our training time yep. and we're like nope nothing gets in the way you yep. know and uh but it took fucking 12 15 years to yeah. get to that level you know yeah. and and you you've got it you do have to eat some shit along the Absolutely. way i mean i remember the days you used to do the same thing you and bass have probably got the, the height sorry you and cameron have the same um work ethic you you've done the 16 hour days yep. you've done the fucking dawn till dusk yep. grind um, the, you know, one thing I'd like to tip on, and I don't know whether you'll allow me to go here, which is the family life that you tipped on before, the sacrifices you've had to make yep. in, that, in that regard. Because a lot of people that probably watch you online don't realise that you're actually a family man. You've yep. got a daughter, you've got yep. a wife, you know, like they see you training constantly, you know. How's that gone? Talk about that. I'll be completely honest with you, and I hate the whole um, stereotype, you know, hashtag blessed. <laughs> but to be completely honest with you, I, I haven't really had to make sacrifices. My wife and daughter travel with me overseas everywhere I go. We've, the longest we've been without is, is probably one week. Yep. Um, and that's, I've got an eight year old daughter. And it, I guess it's because my wife is, she's just amazing like that. She values our family life so much that she won't let that change. Yep. Um, so she makes a point every time it's any of the events that my daughter has, um, any of her athletics carnivals, if she receives an award at school, we're at the school every yep. single time. And it's not just the mum that does it, it's the mum and dad. So we're both there together, yep. embarrassing my little daughter. I don't know if she's embarrassed yet, but she, she damn well will be. <laughs> because because, because we're, we're gonna be at every event uh, yep. for, for her because we prioritize awesome. um, our family. And, and I'm very lucky that it hasn't really got in the way because they um, create the family life around what I do. Yep. Um, my daughter comes to the gym and she loves it. Yep. And I've seen those videos recently, man. It's so inspiring. I've got a three-year-old and a seven-month-old who's buzzing around here somewhere. And I'm, go I'm like trying to get him in here as, as soon as possible. And yep. The kids hang out here so they're comfortable. Yep. Think about the potential of that imagine you were introduced to a gym at three years old yeah Holy so shit. so there's so much that goes behind that and and basically it's it's about i've never wanted to um stuff anything down my daughter's throat i don't want her to be forced to do anything that she doesn't want to do because i don't believe that she'll succeed that way and that's what the beauty of this was she asked me if she could start deadlifting you know one of the yeah. funniest moments was i i had a um i just recently not too long ago i did a log pressing competition and I, it was another little victory. I got an Australian log pressing record in a sport that I don't really train, Practice, yeah. um, which was testament to my training method was just to be strong on every angle yep. and it carries over to other sports. Yep. And so that's a big part of why I did it. But I was watching my video as I do, you know, I watch my videos over and over and over again. Um, call it vanity or call it, you know, self critique or whatever it is. Yep. But my daughter walked in and she watched me watching this video and she started commentating as if it was from my voice. <laughs> and she's like, oh, look at me, I'm Australian strength coach and I'm doing all the reps. <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell are you? Oh, that's awesome. Uh, but she knows the lingo with a lot of exercises. You know, she yeah. talks about, uh, she'll, she'll teach you how to deadlift. It's just freaking amazing. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, grab the bar, knees out on the inside of your arms, pull your shoulder blades down, look up. Um, lean back and push the world away. Like she's telling uh, yep. Felicia how to do these things and it's That's just like, awesome. but, but I didn't teach her that, well, I did teach her these things, but not yeah, through but sitting her down and forcing her to do anything. This is the thing, oh, kids don't, the one thing I've learned with the three, short three years that I've been a dad is that kids don't do what you say, they do what you do. Exactly, and exactly. The apple never falls far from the tree, yep. you know? So when they're seeing you, and this is something that I keep telling, we got so many parents in here, keep grinding, ir irrespective of whether it's for your goal, because the influence you're having on your family is yep. profound yep. and it lasts forever, you yep. know? It's really, really good. There's one last thing I'd really like to quickly dabble on, um, because you just said it, and it's something that I try and teach our guys. So we, our, our whole program is basically, if you peel it right back, it's, bar it's barbells and body weight. We do calisthenics and we do strength training. And 
I've all, we, and our foundations program is designed to build strength. The guys that in, are in the foundations program, they don't do calisthenics yet, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've got like this clear memory of when we first put up our, um, our first ever Swedish ladder and we were playing around on it without any practice at all, you almost did a perfect flag, you know, which is something that Cali guys trained for years and years and years to do. Mm -hmm. So our ethos is that you build foundational strength first and it carries over. And this is the same way that a strength coach trains an athlete. The first thing you do when you get an athlete is make them fucking strong yep. because they're going to perform well in every sport, Definitely. basically. Definitely. You know? So this is something I'd like to talk about very quickly. Building, building strength and, and your experiences with that, as a perfect example, being able to do a, um, a calisthenics movement, what are your thoughts on building raw strength and, and the effect that has on every facet of life, including psychologically, I guess? Yeah, yeah. so I, I can touch on everything, like including psychologically. I've, I've coached not just athletes, but some of the highest, most successful company directors um, as well. And I know from, from feedback from these guys when they talk about um, how confident they are going into a meeting. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a, as we all know that I used to do a bit of martial arts as well. So I used to teach martial arts, uh, you know, a bit of boxing, a bit of strength work. And these guys, knowing that they could probably beat the other guy up in a fight uh, because they were um, stronger and, and uh, had better movement and knew how to protect themselves, it played a huge role in their confidence when yeah. it came to signing business deals, multi, multi million dollar business deals. And that's just like, that, how cool is that? Something I would never have thought of. Yeah. But but I also I analyze a lot of these things like, uh, you know, we're all parents now, and and my uh, you know sport is a high priority of mine, uh, especially for my daughter. I want her to be to want to be good at sports, and you know we encourage with all the the running carnivals, and she's come first every single year. I'm going to say a funny story. Uh, kin she's in year three, so kindergarten she she came second. Uh, sorry, not second. I don't know where she came. She didn't even top, come top three. And a huge part of that was I was on the sideline. And, you know, imagine a kindergarten. Uh, she's five years old. She's running. And I'm on the side going, go, go. And she turns and she stops and looks at me. And I'm like, oh, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so she came, she came um, wasn't top three. And she almost started crying at the end. And someone came and gave her a participation award. And they said, she said, what's this? Is this, did I win? She goes, no, that's better than winning. She's like, and she came and told first place that this was better than, I did better yeah, than you. Yeah. And I'm like, fair enough, yeah. fair enough. As long as she ha she's happy. Anyway, so I was looking at the people that were more athletic, like the, it's just that they're children. They're not athletes, they're just children. I was yep. looking at the differences between them. And my daughter was a little bit young for her year and she was quite petite. Yep. And the people that were fast, were bigger. They yep. probably had better appetites and they actually, ha as dumb as it sounds, they had more muscle mass. The children yep. had more muscle mass, were able to move faster. Absolutely. And it just came from, my daughter ate like a bird, like she's got shit appetite. Yep. You know, she, she doesn't like much food. Yep. And, and I have to force her, like every morning I make her a bowl of porridge and, and I put a little teaspoon of, of whey protein in there as well, just to make sure that she's got at least a really good carbohydrate protein meal mm. to start her day. Yep. Um, and, and I think that goes along way and she sees us eating healthy and 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 we force her to, to eat the healthy shit before she eats her crap stuff you know yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a yeah, pretty yeah. it's a funny thing being a parent and and you know being in control of what your children eat yeah but um the strength differences uh, you know from an athletic level like just running 100 meters that's something that, that most people know how to do they just know how to run yeah you know so you don't really need a huge amount of skill at that level but it's the strongest kids that were winning yeah and absolutely. and the strength came to like the only attribute that you could see was the size yeah uh, and, and these are the kids that were dominating yeah um you know but that's that's from from both levels that's from success in a you know in the corporate world yeah uh, right to, down to children right it's down to children. interesting that you say that i don't know if you've ever read malcolm gladwell's outliers book um they've looked at this and they've looked at what in in, in specific children and there's a couple of things that come into play when they're looking at an elite level performer um, compared to everyone else. And, and, you know, we used to always say, oh, it's all genetics, it's all genetics. It actually isn't. It's actually environmental mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. way they start out. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that seems to be correlated to high performance in the American sports, gymnastics, things like that, is the age of them in, in the school. Mm -hmm. Because when kids up until about 10 years old, a year makes such a big difference, mm -hmm. you know? So if you're born in, in January and you're competing against kids that were born in December, 
yep. there's an obvious difference Absolutely. in physical capability, yep. you know? Yep. And so they looked at all the professional NFL hockey players and the majority of the high-level guys, except, except Wayne Gretzky actually, were all born in the first quarter of the year. Right. Uh, uh, January, February, March, and some of them in April, yep. you know? Yep. And they just dominated physically. And yep. then that has a, a, a ripple effect. It, se it seems to... They're used to winning. Well, they're, they're used to winning. It conditions their mind. And they also get selected for all the top teams yep. in, a, as a young, so they get nurtured better. They mm -hmm. get access to better coaching. They mm -hmm. get access to better facilities, and that ends up just having a roll-on effect throughout yep. their entire life. Yep. You know, so it's it's. I completely it's agree with that. Yeah. So guys, we're going to because we are wrapping this up, but we've had a couple of questions come through for Bass that we're just going to fire over. So uh, Mitchell Jackson um, has asked, when it's time to progress load, in the Aussie strength coach's opinion, should you be using more of an RPE scale or worked percentages in regards to one RM or both? Neither and both, okay? So I don't use RPEs and I very rarely use percentages. So let's just use, for example, Mitchell, did you say? Yeah, Mitchell, yeah. Mitchell, if you came to see me, the first thing I would do, uh, you know, after clearing that you didn't have any injuries or anything like that, is I'd take you over to, um, you know, whatever exercise you wanted to perform. Let's just call it the squat. Um, and I would see how you perform with no weight at all. Yep. Uh, from that point, if you looked like you could handle an empty barbell, I would then put an empty barbell on you. If you couldn't move an empty barbell well, I wouldn't let you progress beyond that. I don't care what your percentage is, I don't know what your max is, I don't know um, what your history is, and I don't care. If you came to me and said you've squatted 400 kilograms and you can't move an empty barbell, I'm not going to let you progress until you go past that for example. So for myself, I, you know, I, I know what I can lift, but I can't lift that every single session. Um, I can't lift even close to that every single session. I could lift that maybe once or two times per year after I spend weeks and weeks and weeks of peaking. So whatever you think that your max is, is not your max. That's your max once or two times per year, not every day of the week. Mm. So if you work on a percentage based on your max, it's incorrect. Mm. Uh, RPE, I quite like that because basically what it's telling you to do is is be conservative. So For those that don't know, Bas, can you tell them what RPE is? RPE please? means rate of perceived exertion. And basically it's telling people a number out of 10, 10 being maxing out, you have zero capability of doing anything beyond that. Um, Whenever you see anyone writing a program with RPEs, you'll never see the number 10 written on your program, which is a very intelligent way of telling people, don't max out. Yeah. yeah, you don't need to max out. That's not what makes you strong. And that's how I used to train and that's how I used to walk around with loads of injuries. Mm. Um, so I, something that I, I said at the start of the session was I don't like lifting heavy weights. I hate lifting heavy weights. Mm. If you watch me train, probably 99% of my training looks easy. I don't grind away on, on barbells anymore. That's not how you get strong. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so RPE is a very effective way of telling people to be conservative with your load selection. Just because you can do, you know, a weight doesn't mean you have to. Just because you can do 10 reps doesn't mean you should do 10 reps. Do nine or eight or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. This is something I was gonna ask. In alignment with that, um, you would obviously then use bar speed as a good indication of whether the weights correct for you. Again, this is subjective, but yes, I do. And I've got a very good eye for bar speed because I've been doing it for so long. Yep. Um, but, you know, to then go and recommend people to go and look at bar speed, the best way of doing that is to, you know, to use a Tendo unit or, or some type of device that literally measures bar the bar speed. speed. And it's a fantastic device for these reasons yeah. is to test your actual uh, what percentage of your max you're working at uh, and if you're training effectively but that's an expen expensive device yeah. and not everyone has access to these yeah. but yes i d personally i'm experienced in measuring bar speed just by eyeballing it, and i can tell if it's moving slow and every lift is different some people lift slow compared yeah. to others some people lift really fast and if it slows down very slightly they'll miss the lift completely yeah. so it's understanding the athlete every athlete's completely different yeah. but but yeah i for me, bar speed is, is pretty much my tool over percentages and, and um, RPEs, is making sure that the bar's moving the way it should move at, at whatever weights that they're lifting. Uh, and if it is, then they're allowed to progress. Yep. Awesome. awesome. So, Mitch, Mitch, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, hopefully that gets it for you, Mitch. It was a great answer, Bass. So thanks, mate. Um, so Dave has just jumped in and thanked you, Bass, for the uh, strength system for the female athlete. He said that was a really great oh, read. Awesome. awesome. And uh, thanks for tuning in, Dave. I haven't seen you for a while, mate. So thank you very much. Um, and our next question for Alex. Alex Allen, how are you, bro? Uh, long time no see. I'm sure you remember I Alex. Know, Alex, yeah. how are you, man? Um, so for Bass, uh, Alex has asked, 
your approach to understanding training methods, lifting techniques, and their accessories seems quite unique. For example, scapular control on tricep dips. Um, how do you develop that knowledge? So, how did you, how did you develop <coughs> that knowledge? Sorry. I guess it was understanding um, the first um, piece of learning that I, uh, based on this style of human movement, came from Mark Buckley uh, years and years ago when I did a check exercise coach course. And we learned all about force couple relationships with the body. So, uh, you know, one part of the body moves, uh, something down the chain moves. So, for example, you know, because you mentioned scapular control, uh, most of my exercises that I talk about involve retraction and depression of the scapula. And I say this is probably the safest, strongest foundation for the shoulder and uh, not just the shoulder position, but the chest and the torso to be in for, for pretty much every single exercise that exists. But something that I say is there's such thing as human movement and then human movement around barbells. So for example, in a bench press, the cue that I use is to pull the shoulder blades back and down towards the back pockets, which is retraction and depression of the scapula. Um, the reason why this is the safest method is because uh, we have a heavy object in our hands and we have a board uh, in our back that's jamming our scapula in place. Now this isn't human movement, this is human movement with yeah, weights, it's yeah. adapting to its environment. So when you have um, uh, the heavy weight in your hands and a board jamming your scapula in place, once you go into protraction, which is actually the natural movement, so when you throw a punch, uh, throw a ball, or, or push an object, the force couple relationship with, with this movement in the arm is, is protraction and elevation of the scapula. Mm -hmm. So human movement, correct human movement, is actually incorrect when it comes to the technique performed on a bench press. Yep. Because if you protract and elevate the scapula, and then you've got that board behind you that's wedging your scapula uh, in that yep. in in, in, incorrect position, and then you come to lower that weight, uh, you're never going to be able to retract the scapula, which is what your body actually wants to do. Yeah. So I teach most of my movements as basically retraction and depression of the scapula is the strongest position. Now, unfortunately, this is creating an imbalance. The imbalance is correct human movement. It does want to protract. The scapula does protract and elevate. Yeah. And if all we're doing is not strengthening that area, we're developing a weak point. Yeah. So it's not my dip exercise. It's a variation of a dip that I perform. Uh, and that is to something that I talk about, so like with a push-up, I try and teach people, if I was ever to perform push-ups, I'd do a, a, a scapular protraction at the end yeah. to strengthen the muscles that I'm neglecting with majority of my uh, other techniques that I do in the weights room when I'm lifting really, really, really heavy weights with my scaps back and down in my back pockets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, I noticed that you um, suggest using M more movement through the scapula in all of your remedial and auxiliary. So, th th like throwing a couple out there, your rows, mm -hmm. your um, lat pulls and chins, things mm -hmm. like. I've noticed lately, and this is, I don't know whether you've had any influence over this, because you certainly had influence over the way I bench press and the way that we teach bench press here, mm -hmm. you know? And people say, oh, you know, you teach a, a powerlifting bench press. Um, wh why is that, da, da, da? Because when we did our PT courses and our um, um, uh, diplomas and things like that many years ago, they always taught you with a flat back and they didn't put any emphasis on the positioning of the shoulders. Mm -hmm. You know, it was always just sort of hold the shoulders. Maybe you got taught to lock them back when you did a seated row or something mm -hmm. like that, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. but it certainly <coughs> wasn't to arch the back and it certainly wasn't to push the shoulder blades downward to depress them, you know, mm -hmm. but lately, and I don't know if it's Mark Buckley's influence as well, because he d certainly teaches this now in his um, FMA courses and stuff like that, which you've uh, had something to do with. They're teaching it across the board. Mm -hmm. I noticed that um, personal trainers, thing. it's a very good thing. Yeah, <laughs> very good thing. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know whether that's just been, because I've only noticed it the last couple of years, yeah. you know? So <clears throat> definitely, um, yeah, <clears throat> I used to work with Mark Buckley very closely, very intelligent guy. And I used to run their powerlifting uh, component of the FMA course. It used to be powerlifting was their level, I believe level two. And then he's changed his education system around. Um, but yeah, he and I have done a lot of work together with that bench press technique as well. So it makes, um, there's no surprise that the FMA model is the same bench press technique that I'm teaching. Yep. Um, uh, just so we're all clear on this, uh, no one invented this, okay? I didn't invent a bench press, I didn't invent a squat. I just used the best techniques that I believe um, it's actually the same one that the, the biggest bench presser on the planet uses. His name is Kirill Sarchev and he's got a 335 kilogram bench press. He uses the same technique that I teach. Yep. And it's basically 
Uh, it's like Taekwondo versus Kung Fu versus Karate uh, versus Muay Thai uh, boxing. They all kind of do the same type of rotation and hip movement of a, of a leg when they kick somebody because we all have two arms, two legs and a, and a body and human movement is human movement. Yeah. And the body kind of figures out the best, most efficient ways of doing things. Yeah. Okay, so just to make it clear, uh, no one invented any of these exercises, but people have a great understanding of human movement will catch on yeah. that when you perform a bench press, the arch... Um, it should kind of occur to people by now that the strongest bench pressers in the world may understand a thing or two. And have it right, yeah. Yeah, about moving things and not being injured. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because being injured, you can't lift heavy objects. So Absolutely. if, you know, the, the best bench pressers in the world will understand a thing about uh, shoulder safety Absolutely. when performing a movement like that. Yeah. Um, so... Um, Sorry, I've just completely sidetracked. Where yeah, no, 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 that's the, fine. Well, I think no, we've pretty no, much yeah, answered so, so, the question. So that's what it was, actually. So what are they teaching uh, today in, in the education system? Um, I, I kind of, I teach a lot of physiotherapists. The, the highest level um, academic that I've ever touched, taught is a neuroscientist. Um, and and I take a lot of pride on, I, take, I teach a lot of doctors. I teach a lot of um, people that should have a better understanding of human movement than yep. just the buff head powerlifter. Yeah, yep. um, because that's what's not taught in formal education. Because people don't have the experience under bars for many, many years at the highest level, yep. uh, and they're teaching to bench press with a flat back. There's so much more to it yep. than just not cheating, yep. because that's how it's perceived that you that all you're doing with an arch is just hurting your back and reducing the range of motion. It's far from that. Yeah, yeah. you know, I love that you've just said that as well, Bass, because I think. Um, we, we get that sometimes uh, the same way that you do. I mean, people that are in, when I say we, I mean people that are in the fitness industry that have been doing this for a very long time. Mm. Um, you'll, you'll post a video and you get all the keyboard experts that come out and try and tell you the literature, you know, says that you should be doing it differently than this and why are you doing it that way? And you're like, well, that's really good, man. I'm glad that you read that in a book. But it, who, there's... Who wrote it? Yeah, that's exactly right. And who wrote it versus who you know, who's produced results yeah. in the real world? Because producing results in the real world, in, in my opinion, and I'm pretty sure in your opinion, holds a lot more weight to it than having a textbook knowledge about that. Yeah. And um, I, think, I think a lot of people out there need to understand that, that before you want to get up and um, go head to head with someone on what the best technique is or the best way to do things, um, maybe have a look at how much time you've spent doing this stuff versus the person that's been doing it for 15 or 20 or 30 years and is producing some of the best results in the world. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I, always, uh, I always find that uh, yeah, even the literature, the literature that they're saying that they've read, it's, it's, it's not really any literature. Yeah. Um, any good literature against what we're talking about. Here. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's not even just the literature. It's just, it's, it's really, uh, you know, I love something that you always said to me, um, you know, when we talk about uh, what you can do or what you've done or what you've this. And I say, look, man, I just, um, I just let the numbers speak for themselves. Exactly. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't boast about what I can do. I just let my numbers speak. And, and I think that's a really good attitude because it's, um, you know, at the end of the day, who really gives a shit what you can argue in an argument? Yeah. Like, show us what you can do exactly. and, and show us what results you've produced or what you've been, been able to produce in other people yeah, as that's, well. That's the big one. Show us the results you've been able to produce in other people because people, you know, people's anatomy and their circumstances are different. We've tipped on mm -hmm. that today. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to, be, as a good coach, you have to be able to work around all of those nuances and those things, mm -hmm. you know. That, yeah, that, it's not that, just what you can produce in your own body. It's what you can, uh, what you can get other people to yeah. do. Yeah. I think that's where people run a little bit they get they go a little bit stray they produce a result in themselves and think that that is the fucking way they are the n equals one they're they're an anomaly yep. they're not the the mean yep. you know average and uh you've got yeah you got to work off a little bit more than just yourself yeah i've seen a lot Conrad. of that before i've got i've got the strongest guys on the planet um that i i am rubbing shoulders with and it's a very fortunate position and i know some of these guys can do things that other bodies can't do and if you watch them try and teach you how to do it it's kind of a little bit comical because it's like <laughs> i can do it so you can do it yeah yeah that's it's like right. that's not how it goes you yeah, know yeah. you're a freak and yeah. i'm not a freak yeah. um but yeah the ability to teach and the ability to be an athlete are two different skills yeah. um but sorry i'm just going to uh, tip a little bit back to one of your first points about um subjective versus objective let the numbers do the talking and this is uh, one of the the reasons behind our system and it's not just my system which appeals to big buff heads but also you know that my uh, other business or my wife's business which is a female only a very pretty version of what i own yep. um 
they, they've got the same methodology, which is let the numbers do the talking. Mm. And yes, they do have mirrors, just like every gym has mirrors and people do like to, to look at their mirrors, but most of the great work is done in the absence of a mirror, yeah. where you don't have the opportunity to be subjective. And we the, the iron doesn't lie. We let the numbers do the talking and it comes to the progress and understanding load selection. So when you know answering uh, Mitch's question about RPEs and percentages and whatever, let's just forget being technical now and, and just sum that up down to be conservative with your load selection give yourself room to grow and let the numbers do the talking so if you come mm. in every week and you're grinding away and you choose weights that are too heavy or you're maxing out every time where do you progress to next week um, probably not very far if you progress at all now is that enjoyable training hell no that sucks so it's a huge part about training morale as well and in <clears throat> enjoying what you do is actually progressing and which is why we love strength training so much you can't see the fat loss every day you can't see the abs pop out daily as, as a as a um, remarkable change right before your very eyes so whatever you can see is subjective but what you can see is a kilogram of weight go on the bar every week or whatever the Absolutely. increment that you have oh, that's exactly right and that's um, that's something where I think both of our uh, training methods as so what we teach here the foundation movement system and your strength system have so much in common is that we're tapping into that intrinsic motivation to want to be better so we're teaching people how to do I mean strength is a part of what we do but we also have a big part of mobility and mm -hmm. gymnastics and calisthenics skill and when you're you know, if all you're focusing on is what you look like in the mirror and or what the scales are saying, your motivation can drop so badly mm -hmm. from just one weekend where you eat a little bit too much carbs mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you just retain a little bit more water in your fat cells and you, everything just starts to look and feel shit. Not and just that, you're on an evolutionary decline irrespective of what you do about it because effectively we're all dying slowly, aren't we? Correct, <laughs> like, correct. Your body's not getting younger. Guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah, but, what you, right. but what you said about the, the motivation of, you know, getting that one kilo extra on the bar um, which you can relate to so many other movement skills you know getting that little bit deeper in your squat or getting that little bit um, you know closer to a you know to touching your toes if you're mm -hmm. not flexible that becomes a really rewarding journey and mm -hmm. then when you and then when you add those little wins up over the years of training when you go from not being able to do anything to being very good at something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh man for me um, that's just so much more rewarding than than the way you look in the mirror and the you know? skill is forever as well yeah. so something that I find with you know ex martial artists or even whatever sport that they play they can always come back to the skill and it's something that they know it's still there yeah whereas yeah. you know you slap 10 kilos on you slap 10 kilos on yeah you're back to where you started <laughs> yeah, absolutely okay we've got time for one more question we'll go for jagan blair summons here hey guys in terms of strength for powerlifting, is there a body fat percentage that is too low to perform optimally in a meet uh, see, so yeah, I think that I think the percentage, body fat percentage is also subjective. For example, I'll go and get a DEXA scan at one person's device and then I'll go the very same day to someone else's and they use a different coefficient, a different algorithm, and yeah. they'll give me a, two different percentages. Yeah. So what your actual percentage is, is um, not really true. So to spit out a number is incorrect. So for example, you hear a lot of people say bodybuilders step up on stage at 2%. 2% uh, is dead. Yeah, so right. that doesn't exist, right? Yep. So these percentages that you, you're talking about, it's, it's a little bit of a, uh, it's not entirely accurate um, just to get that out there. Yep. Um, but you know, let's just say um, to have your abs showing is not bad. You know, yep. to have your, whatever that percentage is, people say that that's roughly, you know, 10% to have all, all six of your abs. I've heard people say, you know, you got the four abs, that's probably about 12% and up. Yep. You know, these are all... Um, this is the thing. And the other thing is the more muscle mass you've got, the more body fat you can carry and still be dexed at below sub 10, like sub exactly. 10%, you know? Exactly. I've seen some guys that I've looked at and gone, I wouldn't guess that they're 10%, but by Dexa, they're 9% yeah. because they're fucking so human gorillas. Mass. they got so much muscle mass, yeah. you know? Yeah. But, but the, at the end of the day, muscle mass is what moves the weight. Yep. And if you look at the, the lowest, um, you know, the body weight classes in, in any strength sport, whether it's uh, weightlifting or powerlifting, the best guys on the planet um, definitely have all of those abs visible. <laughs> Um, you get your anomalies, you get your freaks that, that can't, they are allowed to carry body fat because you're not um, judged based on your appearance, you're judged on your performance. Yep. But, but actually, if you look at the best of the best guys, usually they're, they're pretty damn lean. Yep. But there is a lot of merit to having some body fat um, for, for 
your health, your hormonal health, um, your brain function, uh, your, your joint health. Um, so if you're completely like bodybuilder level lean, your risk of injury is a lot higher. Yeah. Um, so you don't need to be, you're not judged on your appearance, you're judged on your performance, but muscle is what's gonna be moving that weight. Um, and if you think that the fat guy image is, is uh, what the, the best performance is, not entirely accurate. Yep. Not yep. entirely accurate. Awesome, man. Look, we, we could talk all day. And quite frankly, there's so much more I'd like to talk about. There was a whole other topic about round back and straight back lifting that mm-hmm. I was going to try and dig in, but we'll do that. If you're keen, sure, get, I'd, get I'd be happy to do again. that. I, I watched you guys uh, you know, speak about that with Tom. Uh, and I love that episode. I love Tom. Yep. Uh, he's a funny guy. And um, yeah, he obviously knows his stuff. And I loved hearing a little bit about what they do with their chiropractic as well. Yep. Uh, and him explain that. But yeah, yeah, with that round back, yeah, just a little bit of a, a fact that I'll throw out there. There's never been a world record deadlift set with a neutral spine. Yeah. So, so we'll <laughs> that's, just, we'll just that's, that's a bit right. of food, food for thought for everybody. Yep. Um, and they didn't necessarily get injured as a result of that either. Yeah. Yep. So it's, it's not a bad thing. But at the same time, I, I just want to clarify something. I don't teach people how to round back either. Yeah, really? So you, no, you can't teach someone how to do it. It has to that, find the individual. Yeah, I guess. yeah. absolutely. When you're yeah. teaching a novice, so novices out there, don't look at uh, someone who's round backing and thinking they're getting away with it, therefore I should. Yep. Um, you've got to earn your stripes. This is exactly what Stuart McGill says. And my God, I want to talk to you about this because... Um, because Let's uh, save it for another yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah, Let's yeah. Let's save it for another episode. I, you know, yep. I work very closely with um, a very, very intelligent... He used to be a physiotherapist. He's a biomechanist. He's a, he's a 140 kilogram powerlifter. His name's Dr. Andrew Locke, and we run yep. seminars together. Yep. And he teaches a lot on the topic about evolution and the way that the spine is made up. Yep. Uh, not just uh, ligaments and discs, but also the bones in the vertebra and the veins that run through the bones yep. and the length tension of the muscles and what the strongest point is. But as a huge topic to be covered on round back deadlifting. Uh, is it dangerous? In the wrong hands it is. Yep. Uh, is Stuart McGill incorrect? Absolutely not. Yep. Uh, you, you know, if you're gonna teach away, so up and coming deadlifters out there, learn how to deadlift with a neutral spine. Yep. Learn how to lift your, your spine in neutral. But is round back deadlifting? Not in the right hands yeah yep. it's 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 very absolutely safe and strong. absolutely all right look we'll save that for another one Fantastic. um what, last thing i want to finish up is that i've noticed recently and i don't know i don't know if i'm correct here you've launched your online program i have uh and it looks fucking amazing i've jumped online i actually just had it up here before and i had the website up so quick little plug when we go onto the wide screen you yeah. can look at this but um let's talk about this very quickly give yourself a shameful plug because this thank is you i will a lot of hard work yeah lots of hard work and it's probably the most affordable um uh style of of coaching of its kind on the planet i'd say um the the results speak for themselves i've coached the best strongest athletes on the planet and this is current and my methodology involves the highest priority of lifting technique remains as the highest priority and i've provided exercise video tutorials for each and every lift that i provide in the in the program so people always ask is is you know xyz program a good program and my answer is if you're performing it incorrectly the program sucks Shit, yeah. you have to understand what the correct lifting technique is if you understand that the next second highest priority that i have is load selection and that's something that i also provide is a load calculator based on my experience with beginners all the way through to the strongest on the planet. And I've got a very intelligent um, guy that I work with who's created this, the algorithms for my load calculations. And we've calculated it based on all levels, beginner, intermediate, advanced. And we type in all of the numbers to see what works. And we've been able to uh, create the numbers that you should be lifting from the very first week from every single session on all the main lifts wow so we've covered all the exercise video tutorials for the technique we've covered all of the load selection and i'm personally online every single day on my facebook forum where i'm speaking to all of my online athletes giving them critique and feedback on their exercises and getting them stronger so so far we're up to i believe it's week 20 of our program and that's going to be ongoing that's currently 15 dollars a week um, and, it's, and worth, it's, it's worth 15 bucks a week just for the load calculator. For, for every part of it, I look at it going, <laughs> yeah. damn. And everyone's Jesus. coming to, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that run online online coaching and a lot of people are getting pissed off with me because it's like, why are you charging that amount? That's yeah, kind yeah. of, you're, you're bringing down the value of our industry. Um, you know, 
I disagree because I believe there's so much free information available as well. Absolutely. Uh, you could say that that's bringing down the value, but I don't look at it that way. Like I yep. said, I, I like healthy, helping people. Yep. You know, you, you see these people, you know, the, the education system now teaching how to arch in a bench press. Who's that thanks to? Yeah. I'll tell you right now, I'll walk around Australia and see people arch back benching and I'll ask them where they learned that from and they'll tell me that they learned it from me. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's well, not- We not, certainly did. As I said, it's not just because I'm the one that invented it, because I'm the one that's putting it out there. Yeah. You know, and not everyone, every, a lot of people have the mentality that their work shouldn't be given away for free because they've, you know, they've done their time and they deserve to be paid for what they do. I don't know. I love helping people. People are always going to pay you top dollar to walk them through it though. And that's, that's the beauty of I, it. I absolutely agree because it's not just about arching a bench press and it's a two second tutorial. There is so much to it. You and I have both been learning every day for 15 years. There's mm. a lot more to learn than just watching someone arch on a bench. There's yeah. so much more to it. So if I can give away a you know, five minute tip, that's the, yeah. that's nothing. That's, I won't even call it the tip of the iceberg. That's nothing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so where can we find, I've got, the, uh, I've got the page up now. It's australianstrengthcoach.com. That's it. Um, and it's, uh, if you're ever looking, um, the strength system is um, Bass's program. It's uh, it, honestly, probably um, arguably one of the most comprehensive programs. I've had a little flick through. I haven't actually done it or uh, anything, but I've seen Bass train. To answer quickly Alex Allen's question before, the reason why Bass uh, has such a good understanding of auxiliary work and all of the um, bits and pieces that go there is because he's not only done a shitload of education himself and courses and training and aligned himself with the best people in the world, he's put everything to practice for the last 15 years on a day-to-day -day basis. You and your brother um, have probably the t like the, one of the most diligent work ethics I've ever seen. Uh, and I mean that in all Thank sincerity, you, you know, it means like a lot coming from you guys who probably have even a better work ethic. Look, I haven't no, seen I, you I guys mean, stop since, since I, I've known you either. I used to, when I used to train with your brother, he'd come to, to the gym with the flu and I'd say, oh, he'd go, man, I'm fucking sick today. And I'd say, yeah, what are you going to do? Go home. He goes, fuck that. I'm coming to train. Yep. You know, <laughs> like, he's still the same. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just insane. He's, he's, like he's, um, don't get him out of his routine. Yeah. He won't, he won't like you. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. and, and look at the results. I mean, I've, I've, I bump into friends all the time who we started out with and uh, they generally don't look as, in, as good a shape as most of us do. So yep. we've tapped into something, whether yep. it's this intrinsic motivator, whether we're doing the right things, whether we're the smartest dudes, I don't know, I don't think the most so. Most obsessed. The most obsessed and yeah. maybe the most deranged, I don't know, but <laughs> we are doing something right. So Definitely. it's working, we're all, almost 40 now and we look better than we did when we were 30, so. And I hope we can keep doing it for another 10, 20 years, absolutely. keep going. Absolutely, absolutely. Bass, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, brother. Thank you very much for coming Thank on. You so much thank you so much for having me i look forward to doing it again congratulations yeah. for being the strongest dude in the country at 110 we'll kilos we'll mate that. yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> all right guys what a show this was uh this was a big one we won't do our usual study review today because uh, i don't want to bore you guys you've got enough information out of that interview we will be returning next week on Tuesday. We've got an awesome, uh, I think I think we've got a really good nutritionist coming on board. She's uh, unreal. I've been friends with her for many, many years. And uh, I wanna talk about pre and postnatal nutrition because I've had a lot of girls asking me this and I'm a big believer that, you know, men and women should have themselves in the best shape of their lives going into um, raising a family, not just because of the, the chances of having a healthy baby, but fucking keeping yourself sane. And uh, it's probably something we could talk to with you and your wife as well, man. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, guys, uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave Rad to give his finishing uh, comments. Yeah, and uh, of course, thanks to Bass. But also another one that we'll be looking forward to uh, having on the show um, is gonna be Bass, Bass's wife, Felicia, and uh, her sister, Diana, who are the faces, the brains, and everything else behind uh, the sensation Base Body Babes and uh, they're gonna, they'll be on uh, in the coming weeks coming up uh, to talk all things uh, women's fitness and women's strength training and um, you know, training to be strong rather than uh, training to look good. So uh, and, and looking good is just a nice side effect that comes along it, with it. It, it very much is. And if you if you want to go and check out Base Body Babes, you'll see that they are, they know what they're doing. They create great results. And uh, so thanks again, Bass. Uh, we'll see you soon, brother. Thank you, guys. Epic. Still recording? Still recording. So no swearing. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try not to. <laughs> Alrighty, well I'm gonna get out of here. I've got a run. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.